It's in the morning. I am glad we have a chair. Oh, we'll there's we'll a chair there. Clearly we'll in a state of uh, repainting. Yeah. Oh, here, check it out. There's my attendance sheet. Oh, why? Well, sure. well, uh, so it's really official. Oh, we got a new camera on camera there. Like you, know. I think this is is this a sweet spot? Yeah, I think I'm gonna move the camera up a little bit. Amy on. How was looking at you? Looking good. Oh, hey, you're going to switch a slide deck, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, so if you get a chance to sign in on the sign-in sheet, and we're going to be, may have some guests online because we can multi it. One person from at least the San Diego district who wanted to be online because they're too far. Oh, no. The current one. Oh. There's two of us, Matt. I got my husband to come oh, too. The both of you. Okay. We got, so Amy and her husband are on. I seen you at the University of Scouting last weekend. Yes. Thank you, Dave, for sharing. Yeah. Sorry, you won't be here for our cub rub tonight. That's okay. You made enough. Uh, wait. Like that. I think we need to pass with. Uh, yeah, I need sharing permission from Mr. Mike. Uh oh. Mike! The problem with making things multimedia. I know. Hey, but it's not wasted tonight. Ooh, now I got it. All right. Share sharing. And then. The recording is on. Okay, we're good. Sweet. Okay, well, you can switch to my slide deck, but normally I'm Dave Markle. I'm a former Cub Master now, Factory 3 at Cooper Mountain PTO and Cub Scout Roundtable Commissioner. Uh, and helping me tonight is Ray Collette. He's our committee chair for Factory 3. And we'll just go around and introduce ourselves, which there's only one non flyer. So <laughs> yeah. just go ahead and just introduce yourself and share with the group. We were, and sorry, you got, you're not going to see them on camera. So go ahead. Yeah, I'm Joe. I'm with uh, the committee chair of Pac-195. Okay. And I'm Stephen. I'm the I'm the treasurer and uh, assistant den leader for LinkedIn for Pac-195. I'm BC Halk. I'm the Cub Master for Pac-260. I'm Jesse McCann. I'm the Cub Master and advanced chair for Pac-65. Kelly Akins, den leader at Pac-566, and the committee chair for Trooper 615 and 56. And I'll introduce myself. Good introduce Daryl's our guest to be here tonight. So, anyway, thanks for coming and joining us. And hopefully, you got a chance to sign in. And oh, online, we've got um, Amy. Can you guys say what pack you guys are in and your roles? Uh, Amy Sorensen, uh, Pack 454, McMinnville. My husband's the Cub Master, and I do everything else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so basically, they got a two person. Uh, key three. <laughs> yeah. so we also have um, Madhu, Patrick, and Colin. Do anyone of that? Hi, uh, this is Madhu here. I'm uh, the Den leader from PAC 335. And who's the other? Uh, Patrick or Colin, you there? Uh, yeah, this is Patrick Fear. I'm uh, assistant cub master for PAC 872 in Beaverton. Excellent. Can you, can you document those somehow or track that? Sure, I'm going to sign in. And, okay. Colin, and Colin? And Colin, I'm Amy's husband, Cub Master, PAC 454. Oh, God. Excellent. So, great. So, can you advance this right for me? Yep. Um, okay. So, I'm going to talk about the turkey song is our Cub song for tonight, uh, in case you haven't had your pack for November. Uh, cub Grub is going to be acorns. And then well, all training opportunities coming up. Ike of the month is Powell Butte, Blue Pike, 
and we'll go with our interest topic tonight, which is outdoor ethics and leave no trace with Daryl Cross. So let's move on. Let's get to the turkey song. Or, okay, that's me and that's Ray's information. And then, okay, we already did this. <laughs> okay, turkey song. This is a repeat after me song. Okay. Okay, so you can have to repeat after me and do it after I do song. So you might have heard this before or not. But anyway, this is this is going to be it. So I'll just do it. We're going to do it once regular voice, once low voice, once really loud. Okay. So I went down to the river. Went down, down to, to the river. river. And I took a little walk. And I took a little walk. walk. And I came across the turkeys. And I came across the turkeys. And we had a little talk. And we had a little talk. And I watched those turkeys. And I watched those turkeys. And I hung them on the line. And I hung them on the line. I said, we could eat those turkeys. And we could eat those turkeys. Oh, any old time. Any old time. All right, then. Good. serve as professional training for some people's works will accept it as such. And there's even a form online for you to submit it to your employer for them to pay for because the cost has gone up a little bit. I think last year was $250. Now it's $315. What is Wood Badge for those of us who don't? So Wood Badge is basically Baden Powell created the first training session back in 1919 or 1910, something like that. I think it was Brown Brownsea Island in England. And basically to train the leaders who are going to train the scouts. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it started. You want to make sure it was uniform and consistent messaging and ways to just develop the program. So to maintain consistency, they've offered this program for over a hundred years, hundred and a few years now. So it's obviously evolved. And actually a couple of years ago was the 2021 course was the, the first of the updated program to get rid of some stuff that Maybe it's too controversial before and went into some other uh, activities, but the objective is the same to give everyone uh, basically a big immersion into what the program is supposed to do, what the intent is, the different types of programming, what are part of the scouting program, uh, from the uniforms to what we do, and also uh, communication training, dealing with different kind of personalities and traits because you're dealing with both scouts and parents as far as strife and such. So teaching, seeing how you can manage those conversations and some of the soft skills related to this because it's not just about camping it's not about knots and giving away badges but really how do you interact with people so anyway it, it's it's good training because i think there are a lot of concepts i've already received from my professional training through work but they frame it in a scouting uh profile you know in, in the scouting view and it does make sense that you would reframe it that way and so again i always feel like you learn something new every time anytime so I do recommend it. I thought it was good to be jumping in as Cub Master and I didn't expect to be Cub Master. It's a lot different than when I was a kid. So you know, I was a scout as a kid, <laughs> definitely a different uh, animal as a leader. So it anyway. Goes, it goes cut up through Scout PSA, so you'll get the whole gamut. Uh, from cubs all the way to, yeah. My only, and I highly recommend it too. Um, yeah. My only thing, my one thing I would say is if you're in a Cub leader and you're 
transitioning like in the next year, you might, I don't want to say wait, but you have to take something back to your unit to finish it out and you have a year to finish that. So if you're going to be leaving your unit soon, it's kind of hard to do stuff in your unit. I, I struggled with that myself because I was out the next year and then my unit was like, why, why are you trying to make changes in our unit? You're no longer here. Well, that's the thing. So the intent is also you bring something back to your unit. It's like our pack, we pay for our leaders to go to one badge. But, you know, we did have some questions about those who are doing the program as Weeblo leaders or AOL leaders, knowing that you have 18 months to complete your ticket, but you're going to be out of program. So why should we put the bill? So I know Ray had an idea. Hey, if you kind of know where you're going to a troop, maybe you see if they'll split the cost with you. Because um, we try to subsidize because it's, it's a decent chunk of time and we're already taking your, time, your volunteer time. We all get paid the same amount, which is zip. But that being said, I still highly recommend it. Totally, yeah, it's, it's really, really worth it. I think just, just to be clear, you need to go to both sections. That's not a choice. But right. So one, it's, yeah. it, you need both. Because it used to be one week straight, and they tried to break it up into two weekends so people have to take less time off. So anyway. It's a great networking opportunity to meeting other yeah. scouters. Yeah. It's, it's, they get to meet you, and then they bring you into the district house. It's okay. <laughs> Is the, program, is the program at the cub level and the scan at the first level completely different? The whole, no, it, it's, it's everyone's everyone's doing. Doing. I said, so I, like when, I don't, don't want to spoil it, but <laughs> when, you, when you get there, like you first start with cubs and you work your way through, uh -huh. so you're, they're teaching you things at every level. Yeah, um, your group yeah. goes from being a den to a den of patrol, yeah, right? So learn the whole program. you go through the program expedited, mm -hmm. but you go from, it takes everyone through cub scouting, through scouts, BSA, and then you talk about venturing and Group, you know, boat crews if you want, but it's talking about the whole program as a whole. And but you are brought through as Cub Scouts, so they teach talks about the Cub program and the so I, I mean, it's great. I think most leaders should take it as early as possible, then they can take their learnings all the way through the program rather than as a sunsetting last hurrah kind of thing in my volunteership. I'm going to get my wood badge when you're not even there to really put a lot of influence on your unit and the scouts. So, anyway, recommend wood badge and. Even though, like like David says, it, it it's framed in the cups in the the scouting world. The majority of it is just pure leadership training that can be applicable yeah. in your employment and at home and in your resolution, communication styles, and all that. Listening skills, teaching skills, the whole works. It's an amazing oh, program. Nice. Yeah, it's all it nice. really is. And yeah. yeah, and some employers will actually uh, pay for you to go because it it qualifies. For certain for levels of training in certain employment situations. Right. Personal development. I yeah. legit talked with my boss about this mm -hmm. Tuesday. So, yeah. <laughs> you did or are yeah. going to? I did on Tuesday. Are they going yeah. to put the bill? I don't know. Yeah. We're working yeah. on it. Working on it. Okay, yeah. so the hike of the month is the Powell Butte Loop hike. Um, this is a view from the summit, and basically, it's, uh, it's an old boring volcano, and you have a view of Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, Mount Rainier, Mount Jefferson, and Olali Butte, if the weather's clear. Uh, it's a 4.5 mile hike, but there are other shorter loops that you can take to make it shorter for your cubs. The total elevation gain is only 530 feet, so that's good for me. Um, brief description, you know, it's a well-maintained trail, and there's a nature center, and it's, it's forest areas as well as open prairie, and it's off of Powell Butte, southeast corner. So not like you have to go way far out of town, but if you want to do something nice that's not a lot of elevation, there's one, and you know, there's... Now that kids have to take a whole week off for Thanksgiving, you know, maybe you do one of these and our two is Christmas coming up. So again, uh, skills of practice, maybe some map reading, compass reading, plant identification and animal tracks for some of your younger uh, adventures for those cubbies. Next. Cub grub. Okay. I thought something that's fall, but you know, I had so much sugar last weekend that I wasn't going to make the, um, what do you call the candy corn turkeys? Frankly, I, don't, I think candy corns are gross now, and I didn't want to make them. So I thought of something different. So that's acorns. So as you can see there, they made an acorn out of a donut hole dipped in chocolate with a pretzel stem. And the other version is the, the Nutter Butter, my, basically my favorite cookie. The wafers, actually. But the, the cookie is like same thing. One Nutter Butter makes two acorns. So guess what? We have samples that you can pass around and of these delectable treats and it takes one pretzel stick makes three stems so of course you get a bag of pretzel sticks and it's like 300 pretzel sticks so if you guys want to have one of those and of course hopefully nobody has a peanut allergy because yeah. the other next comes next door says so no peanuts you can probably do this with a malasada as well a malasada would be a gigantic I mean, well, a very small. 
Yeah, I would say that uh, your mom thought it would be awesome. With <laughs> mom thought you don't know it's Portuguese donut, it's which is amazing. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, acorns easy, and also we were talking so much about with badge. The acorn has some symbology in that, right? So you'll learn about that the old the old tree and a, and a big cathedral. So anyway, yes. So did you just melt? Yeah, I just took a Hershey a Hershey bar and put it in a double boiler. So I had it on the bowl at the right over a pot that I steam water. Just melted that, dunked it, put it on wax paper to let it cool a little bit, dunked it again at another layer. I mean, it's a little messy from the chocolate perspective, but <laughs> hey, man, acorns. Yeah. But, but peanut butter. So, okay. see, that's we can do that in Cub Grub, but if you were here, this would be for you. All right. Next. Now we're on to our. You have enough time, Daryl? Do I leave you enough time to talk about that? Fine. Okay. Figure it out. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, for those that you that don't know me, my name is Daryl Crossman. I'm the training chair for the district, but I'm also the outdoor ethics advocate for the council. So that means it's my job to promote outdoor ethics throughout the council and to help teach and to help run the trainings and everything else. I also do it for the, the territory. So I also do it for that title as the outdoor ethics uh, or as the outdoor ethics and conservation zone coordinator. So I've got Oregon, Alaska, Washington, and the Far East Council. So I do it on the territory level too. So Obviously, you're, I see that you, you're a trainer, so you've got your pin. Yep. What is your experience? What's your experience with outdoor ethics so far? Because I want to, I, I can run this a couple ways. We can talk about, I can kind of like give you the basics of what this is, or we can focus mostly on just ways to teach it. So, trying to get the ways to teach it. Yep. Okay. So that <laughs> assumes that you guys have a basic knowledge of leave no trace, and we're just going to talk about mostly ways to teach it. So um, go ahead, one more. But we're going to start with the outdoor code. So take one. And pass one. Okay. And then once everyone gets it, who does the outdoor code as part of their pack meeting? We've done it with some pack dating. So okay, I'll, well, if you've done it at all, do then... it. Done it with my woods recently. I got, a, I got my troop to start doing so it. Every, every it meeting, so. Okay, even my own troop doesn't do it, so I'm not giving you a hard time. <laughs> so, um, outdoor ethics start um, with the outdoor code. The outdoor code's been around since the 1940s. So, for scouting, this is where outdoor ethics starts. So, I'll never say that. Okay. You can pull your card out or you can read off the screen. <laughs> so, we're going to. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, as a barrier, be considerate of the conservation mind. Okay. <laughs> I, re I remember this as the four BCs. It's B, and then the next one starts the C. And I get the order wrong all of the time. Unless I have the card I'm actually looking for. It. But it's considerate, clean, careful, and conservation. So, there's the half that. Okay. Uh, it's considerate. You, you flip. I know. I'm, I'm careful. Careful. Unless I'm actually reading it off the card, I flip the order. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about why it's important real fast, and then we'll just talk about um, ways to teach it. So these are kind of old numbers. I tried to look real fast, but they went. So in 1975, we had 7 million visitors in the wilderness areas. By, 20, by 2000, there was up to 20 million. And I'm sure 2020 is another, probably, <laughs> it wouldn't be surprised if it doubled or is close to. Especially with COVID, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, National Parks, at least, is a, a more recent number of, and that's just national parks. They had 300 and 
30, 30 million and 16. And I know it's way higher since then. So go ahead. BSA, these are updated numbers. So 500 million, 200 or 205 million members, councils, units, go ahead. It's over 10, 10 million user days by the BSA alone. This used to be 15 before LDS left. So, but, and that's just us. We put more people in the outdoors than any other organization. So, one of those impacts, or one person making an impact doesn't really matter. But when you do 10, 10 million, it adds up. So, we've got recreational uh, impacts. We've got someone that just decided to dig a campfire pit and leave, leave trash all, all over the place. We've got people that are carving into their trees. And we've got a bear that's decided to have lunch on the table because the other people left their stuff all over, right? Okay. We've got soil impacts. So, we've got loss of organic litter. So, this one here, you can see that that. All the bare, all the ground is bare because everyone's, all the pine needles, and everything else that should be there are all trampled or gone. We've got erosion. We've got trail creep where it should be one trail and we've got three there. We've got the vegetable and uh, the vegetation impacts with loss of bark and everything else, invasive species and tree damage. We've got wildlife impacts from people feeding things feeding animals and altering their behavior to reduce um, health and reproductive in those animals. When you feed a, oh, go back one more, oh, you're not quite there. Um, and then there's there's water resources. So turbidity is, and sedimentation, it's, you know, the, the water getting dirty from, not, and discolored. Um, and runoff from soap and fecal wastes, waste. Okay. Social impacts. With all of those people, there's getting more and more people and there's more crowding. Um, and conflicts between the different kinds of user groups. Theft of cultural artifacts. People trying to cut out petroglyphs and take them home. And thefts of artifacts. Um, so it all adds up. When one person does it, it's still going to make a difference if someone cuts that that one person that tried to cut that petroglyph off, right? But they add up. When you have 15 million, when one person takes a cheap souvenir and then 15 million take something else, there's not a whole lot left, right? So this is really why. Um, there's improving the reputation of scouts too because we're visible and we're out there. They used to teach dig a dig a hole or dig, dig a trench around your camp your tent. So mm -hmm. if you had if uh, it was going to rain, it just wouldn't go into your tent. Now they teach, now we teach buy better gear and don't do that. <laughs> um, they used to go do pioneering projects and just go cut down the trees to go make their pioneering projects. So. There's lots of stories that of how much damage the scouts have done, and we're really trying to reverse that and become stewards of that. So we're gonna go to the stem principles. Uh, go on. Okay. So we've got the regular principles here, and then kind of the Cub Scout, Cub Scout versions, which is just the same thing said in an easier way for them to understand. So there's hand movements that go along with this. So we're gonna. We're gonna go with it. So I don't know the Cub Scout ones by heart, so I have to look at this to actually do. So well, I do it. What? You got Cub Scout part. I do actually right here. I can read off that. I am not don't have a name. But I've got one. Number one. Number one, yes. So number one, so it's there's a the number of fingers equals the number of principal, the number of the principal number it is. So that way it'll help you and it'll help them. So number one is know before you go. Mm -hmm. like Number one, no, no, before you get yeah. yeah. Um, two is choose the right path. 
Number three is trash or trash. So we're going to pick up trash. So three fingers and we're going to pick up trash. And four is leave it to find. So we're going to take, we're going to use a camera or a phone to take pictures. Okay. Number five is minimize campfire impacts or be careful of fire. So we're going to make a fire. Six is respect wildlife. So we're going to make moose horns. I've done this too. Or the respect turkey. the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Kids like respect the turkey. Um, and then seven is be considered other visitors. So we're going to make a peace sign in five, and we're just going to wave. We're going to wave and be. Okay. So does that make all? Yeah. Am I in the screen? Am I, or did I wander too far? Uh, no, you're in the screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're all going to do that again when we're done, so we remember. Okay. Okay, so travel and camp on durable surfaces. No, um, choose the right path. So there's a downloadable PDF that you can find pretty easily. Um, so we're going to talk about what are durable, durable um, surfaces and non-durable surfaces. So we're going to play a game. So you want to. So what we have here are different kinds of surfaces. Some of them are durable and some of them aren't. So who wants to jump or step? Right, you're doing it. You're sitting here. So step <laughs> on the oh. durable surfaces. Start on the center. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. It's hopscotch. Well, let's see. This one. That one. That's it. Yep. Think you missed anything? Uh, I mean, there's a skill there. Right? Why would he? Why would he? Oh, that's oh, that's mud. Yeah, yeah. I see. But in in this case, you would still stay on the trail. That's not yeah. the snow, right? I, yeah. There's a couple of tricky ones in there because that yeah. one's a trail too. Dry grasses. Yeah. Oh, and I so. see the sand. Okay. All right. What about the river? Is this a durable surface? No. Rigidity and sediment. Anyone else have a different opinion? Into the water. It depends on what you're doing. If you're on a boat, it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it depends on, so it depends on your activity, mm -hmm. if it's a durable surface. Um, snow, you didn't step on that one. Is that a durable surface? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean. uh, snow is generally considered a durable surface if it's at least six inches deep. Okay. So mm -hmm. as long as your, your footfalls aren't going to, Crush the crush the yeah the plant life underneath. So he stepped, um, and obviously, so he stepped on the trail. I assume. Right? Yeah, yeah. That we did. Um, the mud, the muddy trail is that durable surface? Yeah. Why not? Because you just need to It is a trail though. It yeah. If you stay in the worn trail part, yeah. So, what? But what was your answer? So if you say you leave footprints, you would actually be yeah. So that you've got a trail there and the mud muddy trail there. It's a durable surface there, but maybe not so much there. Right. So there's ways to get around it. So you can keep it if you wear um, gaiters, which not very many people have, but gaiters will cover your, your shoes and your the bottom of your legs. Then you can go through the puddles and everything else. But people are the are going to tend to walk around the mud, and then they're just going to make it a bigger trail. So then it's really not durable, right? So yeah. um, when you're choosing trails uh, for Cub Scouts, or just choosing trails in general, make sure you think about the weather. Is this, are we going to, is this trail going to be really bad? Is it really muddy? Maybe we're going to choose a place that's got more established trails that we're not going to, or trails that, are paved or gravel or something like that. That isn't going to be like this. Um, dry grasses. Yeah. The trail in the middle is durable. You walk on the outside, it's probably going to, that's one of those, yeah, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. The other one there. Has anyone? <laughs> <Is it Yellowstone? laughs> this one here. Cryptobiotic soil. Has anyone even heard of that? 
okay, what is it? Uh, it's soil that is basically like held up by little mosses and lichens and all sorts of other stuff. Mm -hmm. so the desert area has that crust, kind of like yeah. you, do, you step on, you break through, yeah. and you leave it, it crushes rather than it, uh, it starts, yeah. away and mm -hmm. everything else. You damage it, you damage the crust, the birds and layers, and you step on it. Yeah, it takes hundreds of years for those crusts to form and everything else. And once it puts up, will really last hundreds of years. So that's probably the most sensitive area that we have down here. Um, and like I said, it's in the desert area. Um, I took my my master educator course, which is now level two, um, in Arizona, and there, there's a lot of it there. Um, my, my house has where when I built it out there, <laughs> and the it's the rangers are very protective of those those spots. Uh, you stepped on rocks. Is that durable? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, not the lichens. Not, but not with the lichens. Not the lichens. Okay. Uh, what about the flower meadow? No. Okay. So if we do come to a flower meadow and we have we have to cross it, I don't know why there wouldn't be a trail through it. Mm -hmm. But if you're bushwhacking, you're going across trail, and you have to come in upon, how do you should we go in a straight line or should we spread out? Yeah. Should kind of think on that. Right. That's part of an argument. Either you're going a straight line, 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 right? You're only cutting one trail through it. You spread out. You spread out. But you're more likely for everybody to turn four or anything. You spread out. Might be less than that. Spread out. Okay. Spread out. So if you want to actually show this, it works best if you have sand mm. or something like sand works best. Mm. Um, and have have people spread out. And then walk and then look the trails, or go back and have everyone walk in a single file line over the same road, and you can see the impact. Hmm. Um, when I do it, when I teach it normally, I make sure I'm the last line and I make my footprints a little bit bigger. <laughs> but it, um, even without that, you can still really tell the difference. They'll be able to come back a lot faster with one person walking over versus the whole group. So, okay. um, and then this is a moss, mossy rock. I mentioned moss. Is this going to be durable? No. Okay. So there you go. So this is a fun way that you can see pictures and you can actually move and do everything with it, right? So that's hopscotch. Can you move your computer? Yeah. Rotate. <laughs> okay. This is that one. So, dispose of waste properly. So, with Cub Scouts, you should always be going to a place that has a batter. So, you, you don't have to worry about the being a cat. Who knows? Who doesn't know what a cat hole is? So everyone knows the cat hole is. Okay. So we know that we dig a we dig a hole that's six inches deep, two hundred feet away from a trail or water source to go dig our to go uh, do our solid waste in. And depending on where you're at, depends on if you either need to pack it out and pack out your toilet paper. Our forest here, unless you go too high, unless you go up to the alpine level, get it wet, get your toilet paper wet. Bury in the hole, it's fine. As long as you bury it and don't leave it on the ground. So, because people will do that. And then nice, ugly TP flowers. Mm -hmm. So, a big part of, um, so we call this trash to trash for Cub Scouts. So it's really picking up trash and making sure you have your trash bags and you secure your trash and they're not littering and everything else. Right. So, as adults, it's planning your food so you don't have a bunch of waste um, and making sure that you have trash bags when you, you know, you do have the waste to take all that stuff. So, go ahead. It's doing your dishes. So, when you strain your water, do your, so strain, actually use a colander and strain all your water out. And then you can scrape all of those debris out and throw them in your trash can. So just as you just as you would you'd rinse them out anyway, your washers out anyways, just drain those instead. 
and then broadcast them, your the strained water go 200 feet away from your campsite from a water source. They use it for everything. Um, and then just dump it and spray it like that. If you're at a place that has the sun, obviously that's going to be your first choice. So, so do that. So. We went with the double C with the troop. What? The, for the center of the colander, we bought double sieves or whatever they're called. But yeah. it's got a fine mesh in it, okay. different layers. Yeah. And I mean, it captures a lot. Captures a lot. So yeah. um, it's a lot better than the colander. So we're even less that we're dispersing out. Nice. Um, so trash timeline. So this is another fun one that you put out different things. Come on, and then you better guess how long they last. You have to guess how long they last. So yeah, I'm going to just make you guys play. And then you have to find those. And if I get too far, then we'll start skipping things. Okay. So these are your items. And now you gotta figure out, you gotta match the times to oh. Oh, look at that. To the, to the items. How long does it take to decompose? Multiple uh, things per year? Or what, what do we find in archaeological? <laughs> <laughs> so there should be one, there's one, if I'm not missing any cards, then there are one for one match. I think here. I think the glass is on the longer than forward. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess these are the same. You can just double them up on those, I guess. But here there's a one and a two. Oh, so you're right about that. Three of three of those ones and two other each. I would put that on five. Okay, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
it will at least so it will repel the insects for a little bit until mm -hmm. eventually it will. So um, there's arguments that the plastic bag and the nylon fabric will last forever with micro with microplastics. Yeah, yeah. That's a uh, newer, newer argument versus yeah. when when this was created. So um, but this is a fun so you can spread them out and you can do it this way, or you can gather real items. And if you want to, if you want them to touch more than this is kind there, of, is there like an online resource to print this stuff? Yeah. And, and I printed this stuff once and, and mm -hmm. laminated it, and yeah. I've used it for years. Yeah. So That's I use great. it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you see this one. Okay. So you just start saying print. No, uh, I don't have to show you. So, like, I don't know. Print it. Print it. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So leave it to find. This is one of the ones that sometimes people have the hardest time of figuring out and wrapping their hand around it. Because everyone wants that cheap souvenir, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants that little token, that seashell or that really cool rock that you found or whatever it is. We've all done it. I've done it too. Until I really started figuring out. The reason that makes it so that thing that you found so cool is because you, you found it out in nature. You found you had that sense of discovery with it and everything else. And if you take that home, then you take that sense of away, the discovery away from someone else. And then it just becomes junk eventually. Eventually, you know, they go on shelves or whatever, or a drawer or whatever. And then the, it's just another piece of junk eventually at home. So Leave what you find is also um, talks about is also leaving it as you found it. So not digging those those trenches around your sand site. Um, cleaning cleaning your gear off between trips so you stop and prevent your the invasive species and that kind of thing. So leave what you find is also leave it as you found it um, and that kind of thing. So a great way. Go ahead to the next one. One thing I like to add, especially for the Cub Scouts, is is picking flowers is fun, but that's how they reproduce. And if you pick the flower, then you won't get more plants next. Especially true with trillions, right? Yeah. That's a, so a great way to do this is to go to the dollar store and get like, or dollar twenty five cents or whatever it is now, <laughs> and get a couple of cheap puzzles, and. Give them cut puzzles, but take pieces, take a couple like key pieces out and have them in your pocket. And then when they figure out, oh, I'm missing something, then you can bring that point up. Like, oh, well, I thought this was really cool. So, and I thought this was really cool. And sometimes you take a big, you know, like one piece will have, one puzzle will have, you know, three or four pieces where one or two only have one or two. And so it really drives that, that message home that way. Okay. So minimize campfire impacts. Why we do this is obvious, you know, fire and everything else. Um go ahead. Different ways to do this. Um using camp stoves and not cooking over the fire. Um every time and fire pit fire rings are not trash cans. That when you burn something in the fire and leave it behind it attracts animals later on, and animals will come and dig through the fire pit. Hopefully, you've left it out. You should have left it out, and so they won't burn themselves, but they'll still make a mess, and it'll draw them to the campsite. So, rangers have to go every year and dig through and dig out fire rings to keep them low enough because people don't burn, you know, don't burn all their wood and burn trash in it. And their trash uh, cans. I find cans all the time, and Things like that. Also, burning paper, it can float up and eventually, you know, potentially spark something else somewhere else. So, think about using a fire pan. We use, especially for, for Dutch ovens, we use metal oil pans for, mm -hmm. for um, the Dutch ovens for the coals. One face down, so it gives you a barrier, and then one up to make sure they all collect mm -hmm. in it. So that way it protects the earth from scorching. It actually helps keep the coal, the charcoal warmer because it's, all the heat's not leaching, leaking out to the ground. So it helps for that too. Um, and it keeps it contained and everything else. 
So when you're doing Dutch ovens, that's a great way to do it. Um, one more, you can build a mound fire. So a mound fire is if you have a fire resistant cloth, which are harder to find than you think. Um, you can dig, um, find upturned ground, upturned soil that's mineral soil. Like think of um, an upturned tree, a tree that's fallen over in the, the soil that's underneath it. And then gather it and make a small fire uh, three to four inches. And then make a twiggy fire. So just enough that they're small enough, you know, just twigs. The four Ds of fire are dead down, distant, and dinky. So dead down are pretty self-explanatory. Distant, they want you to go 200 feet away from your fire, from your campsite to go find wood. So that way you don't have those campsites that's completely picked over and everything's, all the organic layers lost. And then just a dinky is smaller than your wrist. So if it's the smaller it is, the most the more likely you are to actually burn it down to ash. And that, that's your goal is burn it to ash and then then you're just returning nutrients back to the ground, right? When you put your soil back. So respect wildlife. So we did our respect wildlife with our horns, our respecting the turkey. And then we can take our thumb and do the rule of thumb. Put your thumb out, close one eye. If whatever you're looking at is not covered by your thumb, then you are too close. So obviously the bigger animal, the farther away you want to be. That's a really easy one for them to understand. Um, ultimately, if you being there is impacting their behavior, you're too close, right? But the rule of thumb is a good one that they can they can grasp and understand. So as adults, you want to make sure that you're securing, respecting my life is securing your food for for the troop and for the pack. Um, making sure that you didn't leave all your food out because I've been planning at Fort Stevens where some camper decided to leave their grocery bags on the table and the raccoons were having a party. Yeah. I went over to the bathroom and they were had, there was at least four or five and they were giant raccoons. And they had stuff everywhere. And they were just having a party because people left their two bags of groceries sitting on the table and they were camping in a yurt. <laughs> so that's a big part of respecting wildlife. Also, as we said, you know, being too close and being aware of mating seasons and those kind of things. There's certain areas that are sensitive depending on where you're going. So, and not feeding the food. Like we saw that that picture with the, actually, go, go ahead. The granola bar. Yeah. The granola bar. Um, Having a bin for for snacks that will latch, and have your your scouts putting put their snack bags in the bin, so it's not in their tent where the squirrels won't come and eat through the, chew through their bags. And um, I've heard stories, and I've talked to people that they've had raccoons drag up bags out of out of uh, mini vacs because people left food in them, mm -hmm. and then they found it, you know. Down the trail somewhere off on the side of the trail, the nice big hole in it. So um, there's the, the saying, you know, a fed bear is a dead bear. Anytime they get used to that, they start losing their fear, people, and eventually it's never ends well for them. So a good way to think about this is the role reversal. And I'm pretty sure we still we do this in come in lions still, or at least they used to. Um, where everyone think of their favorite animal. Okay, Jesse, what's your favorite animal? <laughs> uh, I like tortoises. Tortoises, okay. What's your favorite animal? Dogs. Dogs. Moose. Moose. Wild animal? An animal. Alpaca. Alpaca, okay. Uh, deer. Deer, okay. So, you are your favorite animal. Now, think about if you're at home, or just, okay, so think, pick your favorite animal aside, but now think about being at home and having someone, having your friend come over or someone come into, over to your house and eat all your food and play with all your toys and break some and leave a big mess and then leave. 
how are you going to feel when you come home and you find a giant mess, your food's eaten, or you're still there and you see it happen in front of you? How are you going to make that feel? Now you're a deer, and this has happened in your, your place. How are you going to feel? Yeah, you're going to run away, right? Okay. How are you going to feel? <laughs> but you might not come back and mate or dig, build your nest in that same area, right? Okay. So. Impressive movie. Yeah. <laughs> you, you might get mad. You, yeah. might, you might get aggressive, right? The moose, for sure. What are you going to do? Yeah. Not great. Yeah. So. When you do the the role reversal, it gets them really thinking about putting them in the other in the other space, um, and it it works, and they understand it from from lines all the way up. So, okay, be concerned of other visitors. Um, be kind to others. I think is what it is on here. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, this one was initially not one of the seven principles. They had to add it because there were too many conflicts out there. So um, you can really tie this into the scout with the law, right? You can serve it kind and all those other things. So there's great, great ways. You can tie them all in, but um, go ahead to the next. So I mean, yeah, go ahead to the next one. Okay, so this is, again, uh, a great way to teach it is have those random adults that hopefully are doing something. You may be a sibling or a den chief or something like that. It's a great one to use those other people. So have a do it on a trail or some kind of linear path or you know some kind of way, and have people do different different scenarios. You get one person that will take and set all of their stuff right in the middle of the trail and take all of their stuff out and just sit in the middle of the trail and do stuff. Have someone talk on their lap on their phone really loud. Um, having someone else play music. You know, this is. Um, Visitors of close encounters of the unkind and have them think about, you know, how do you feel if you're on this trail hiking and you run into all of these things? Do we want, do we want to behave that way? Do we want to encounter that? Um, and again, it's the same, very similar to the role reversals. Um, so, but it helps them teach that and helps them understand that. Right? So. Plan ahead and prepare. This was the first principle, but we're going to talk about it on the last. Except for you, why do we do this? Because he knows he's been doing the training. Uh, so you can be prepared, right? So you can be ready for whatever. You know where you're going. You, you can avoid getting yourself into a situation where you have to trample something. You can come with the right equipment, right, right clothing. You can have the right food. You can be prepared to just know it before you go. Yeah. Sure you every go. every other principle ties into this. That's the one they're looking for. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. we talked about last because like said, you can plan ahead for for every one. So you already did plan ahead and prepare for part of it. So how do we plan ahead and prepare for choose the right path? Just knowing your route. Knowing your route. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe knowing alternative routes. Um if mm -hmm. you're camping, if you're backpacking knowing where different campsites are and knowing where alternative campsites are in case the one the first one you get to is busy. Knowing about closures and permits required and all that. Yeah, all, all, all of that stuff. Um, so how are we if um, how are we gonna trash or trash? How are we gonna plan ahead and prepare to trash or trash? Beforehand. Know what facilities are available. Okay. Uh, there's locking bins if there's you know bear bins or things. You're going to need to bring bags in if you need some of the van. Stuff. I mean, what you're going to eat. So you, you know, not yeah. have a bunch of food and camp, they're going to be bringing right. in a mouth bag. If, you're, if, you're backpack, if you're backpacking, yeah. right, you're probably not bringing the big lockable bits, right? So you need to have a way to store your food. Yeah. Sure. Um, so all, you know, those are, um, having, I always take a trash bag with me. It's, it's a, I call it a dirt bag. It's a dirt bag. So mm -hmm. it's just, a, it's a dry bag that's, just a trash bag. So I roll it up, and it doesn't matter what it's going to go into it because it's going to roll up and it's not going to go, it's going to hang on the outside of my backpack. Um, and it's a trash bag to pick up and fish trash in as we go. Um, 
we always like to play um, games of have who can see who can pick the most trash. Sometimes yeah. you need to. You've got gloves if you're concerned about that. That's always yeah. a good thing. Or grippers, something like that. But there's a, that's another great way to trash and trash and start modeling that as you go. Um, uh, trash, trash. Uh, leave what you find. How are we going to plan ahead and where to leave what we find? Bring the camera. You know, phone, right? Yeah. Designate, um, have a moment to sit down and say, okay, we're going to draw something this time. Everyone bring a sketchbook or notepad. Take rubbins. Yeah, take rubbins, things like that. So those are great ways. Um, having a scout be the designated photographer, right? Or, hey, I found this really cool thing. So and so's got the camera today, if it's the dinner or whatever it is, right? If you find something, let him let them know and then they can take the picture. Right? So um minimize campfire impacts. So how are we gonna plan ahead and prepare to do that? Or you bring your pans or you know, you just gonna have some clue about what you're gonna do with the fires, I suppose. Bring a stove, bring a stove, stove yeah. Bring, bring so if you're planning to head to a known campsite, you know, what's there? Do they have one of those mm -hmm. grill setups that may have been installed? And source your wood locally so you're not bringing beetles in or something. Yeah. You beat me to that one. Yeah. <laughs> that you never, you always want to get your, your wood locally. Don't take it across uh, mountain ranges for sure. Mm -hmm. It's a big one to stop that invasive species. Um, and then find out if it's even, if you're even allowed, if, it's, if they're permitted. Yeah. If they aren't, Think about doing a water ball or water bottle lantern. So if you take clear water bottles and put a flashlight in the center, and then you have a still have a nice light and gathering place to sit around, and you can still talk and have things like that. So, go ahead. Oh, um, then that. So, respect wildlife. How are we going to plan ahead and prepare to respect wildlife? Know what's in the area? Know what's in the area. Like if you're heading to Yellowstone, don't mess with the bison. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No fluffy cows. Make sure. Make sure everyone knows the whole thing. Making sure you've got things that latch and lock. Mm -hmm. And when you go to bed at night, you know, that they're secure. Sometimes we, we'll put them underneath a uh, bench, pick the, the seats mm -hmm. of the bench so they can't get to get to them or pile heavy Dutch ovens on top of them so they can't get to them. Although I've seen that too to try to move those two. So how are we going to plan ahead and prepare to respect to be concerned of other visitors? Don't bring portable speakers. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Don't no, need to have it. No. That's a that's a big thing. Um maybe when you're doing if you're doing big uh pack addings Make sure, like, split your group into smaller groups, to dens or something like that. Because if you have your whole group going, they can get a lot louder if everyone's talking over each other, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going on hikes or whatever. If you're going in wilderness areas, the max group size is 12 heartbeats. So you won't be doing that with Cub Scouts, but if you ever go, um, and that so that will include any kind of animals. That's why it's heartbeats. Mm -hmm. um, that's why when our council does horse trek, they don't go through the wilderness areas because they can't. They give rules and regulations. So, um, that, and be conservative. There's a triangle, there's a yield triangle that I thought was inherent, but I guess it wasn't, um, for being conserved to other visitors. So, everyone yields to horses if you're on a multi use trail. Um, and mountain bikers are supposed to yield to everyone. <laughs> Um, Sorry. Yes. Um, so hikers, if you're hiking, um, if you're passing another hiker, you're supposed to yield to the people going uphill. Most of the time, those people will happy to step aside and take a break. Yeah. But <laughs> if they're on a they're on a rhythm, you're supposed to yield to the people going uphill. Um, when you do stop and take a break, make sure you go off the trail and off the side. Find a an area that's Durable a durable surface, surface that you can that you can take a break on, um, and don't can't don't take everything out right in the middle of the trail. Also, don't block um, trail signs. 
because I had been hiding and had it only because I knew where I was going, but I had the scouts and leading missed the trail sign because someone was sitting right in front of me <laughs> and had to say, okay, you know, I'm going to go for five or 10 minutes and then, so you think we're going the right way? So, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so a great way to bring the, play this is what not to bring. So spread everything out um, on tarps or you don't even have to do that, but have a bunch of stuff that you know that they'll need and stuff that they completely won't need. Um, and some really crazy things just for fun. And then have them make, and if you have enough for two sets, have two sets and then make it a race. Okay, go grab everything they need that you should have for this camp out and then bring it and put it over here. It's fun, you run, you go do things, everyone takes a turn, and then we talk about it when we're done, right? So it's a great, fun way to do it. And I did that when we were doing the country, so, uh-huh. And bring some questionable items, like bring the speaker, because someone will grab it. Someone will grab it. Yeah. Um, you need that. I know. That's, 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 that's the unknown. Sentence. So, <laughs> they're all fun things. It's a great way to actually do it, especially when you're doing with all the different adventures. Um, go ahead. So, advancement. It's in every level throughout the way, in some form or another. And I know the program's changing really soon, but yep. the, the announcement's coming out tomorrow, I think. Um, so, but go ahead and what's the next slide? Overall, there it starts off. With, I know this is the old line match, but um, they start off by listening and reciting, talking about it. They're demonstrating it, and then they're explaining it as as they move through the rounds. So, so but this is an award. Yes catch that you can earn that this is open for adults and scouts bsa yeah. um the first thing you need to do is to take an awareness or training shop this counts you've done the hardest part of earning this award the next the other four parts are explaining the outdoor code there's two online trainings um one lead no trace and one tread lightly. You take them online and then you print out the certificate. And then you watch the National Parks video. So there's a 10 minute National Parks video that you can stream and show. The resolution isn't great because it was made long enough that it's for high resolution. But it's a great introduction. Um, and you watch that. And then that's the entire work. So even as scouters, you guys can come with us now. There's a, a sheet you fill out and mark off your site. You can give copies of the stuff that the online gives you certificates. You just turn it into your advancement chair and they can get it at the scout shop. Yeah. Cool. So go ahead. There's lots of other awards when you get to Scouts BSA and everything. But we're, they took away the Cub Scout Award. Hopefully they'll bring it back, but it's been gone for quite a few years. So resources. The I pulled out Bigfoot's playbook. I use this more than I use anything else. The, there's the PDF that goes along with this. This is where the hopscotch come from, the roll reversals in here. These, the cards are in here. There's lots of other games in here too, but it's made for, for camps and scouts and everything else with that. So there's lots of other games in here too. In the back, there's a, cross-reference guide that even shows you like the group size, the age, and everything else. So, and the principal or everything else. So you can go right to what you're looking for. And you get this at at uh, lnt.org is where you buy all the Lima Trace resources. Um, and I highly recommend, if you only buy one thing, I would buy, I would buy this. Um, then there's lots of other things that you can get. So 
many of those do I have? I've got so you hang tags. I only have a couple. I haven't really slide yet. The white ones are the ones I've got here. You can have one. Yeah, I, I, have, I have the one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? I've got one. You got one of those? Okay, here. There's three there. You guys can choose which one you want. So, but the hang tags, they've all said that they're for different activities. So it depends on what you're doing. They all kind of have specialty things for the different activities like winter sports or bouldering or hunting or fishing. Or like so they'll give you kind of specifics about that activity. And if I'm, I keep mine, I've got my set on my backpack that I just, it's always hanging around a bit, always hanging a little back. Mine are so worn, you can't even read them anymore because they've been worn out. <laughs> Most of those have, been, have had this since 2006. Or 17, so we're starting to wear out. But it's only the last year or so, year or two, they started to wear out. So those are fun, fun way to go. The go ahead and one yep. more. It's only a few bucks to get a stack of the youth cards for uh, for a den. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cheap. Uh, this is what the youth one looks like. So I yeah, have yeah. one of these, but it's got the, especially if you're working for. Oh, yeah. that's cool. yeah. So, and they're 25 cents each for the cards. You buy a stack. And these will be out five to grade in like 100 years. So. Yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> probably longer than that. They're yeah. pretty thick. So, if you go to lnt.org, there's lots of resources. They've got YouTube videos and everything else. So, go ahead to the next one. Oh, so here's lots of pictures. They've got little booklets that these ones. The, this is the Pacific Northwest and North America guide are no longer in print, but you can find they actually digital copies of these, so you can just download them too for free. They've got a new one. Um, so that is that. Go ahead to the next one. So this is awareness. We went through this really fast. If you want to learn more and you want to become a trainer, they recently redid their training structure. So. It used to be the awareness and the one-on-one -on -one course was the basic level. And then it used to be the lead nurse race trainer that's now a level one structure. It's a weekend long course. The next time that we will teach it and CPC will be at the April Super Weekend at Camp Mary Weather. Um, it's a great course. I will be teaching it along with some other people. Um, and then the level two, which used to be called the Master Educator course, that's what I am that allows me to teach the trainer course and everything else is a week long course. Um, and those, you know, I have to travel somewhere to go to. I went to Arizona for mine, but they teach them at all the high adventure bases. And hopefully, Chief Seattle is doing one this summer. Let's see if they actually submit their paperwork and, and get it in. But that will be the first one in the Northwest in a long, long time. I don't the last time we actually have to. So, that's go ahead. Oh, there's the, the April Super Weekend. That's the next training course. And you get a pin. He's got one. Black one. It's a gleam. I'm almost done, Mike. Hold on. <laughs> like, literally, like, I'm on the last. Go ahead, show. Okay, take the big foot challenge. So, teach, teach your friend or teach all your youth. Take your trash bag. They're kind of giving. Um, Clean up after your dog, all this kind of fun stuff. Someone actually has a big foot challenge card. All right. And then the last slide. So outdoor ethics is really about enjoying the outdoors responsibly. So hopefully I've viewed some of my passion back in you, and you can take that forward. So that's what I got. Any questions? Thank you. All right. <laughs>